Most people come to the beach to relax, and I'm no exception. But what may be a bit unusual in my case is that I find thinking about lost civilizations, such as Atlantis, as having a calming and even relaxing effect on me. That said, contemplating ancient myths and legends is not enough. I also try to prove or disprove theories scientifically, especially in cases pertaining to the inner earth, where only speculation seems to exist. One fascinating experiment that I stumbled upon took place aboard the space station, which is only about a minute long and involved a demonstration of what happens to a rotating sphere of water in microgravity that I'd like to play now before we start today's episode. Here we have a rotating sphere of water about 25 millimeters in diameter and inside this sphere are a whole bunch of little tiny air bubbles. And we will see what the angular acceleration due to rotation does to these air bubbles as a function of time. What you are observing are the bubbles moving to the center axis of rotation. As a function of time, they will form this rather tightly packed uh, bubble core. These bubbles are kept from coalescing from a small amount of added surfactant to the water. Here we have a rotating sphere filled with bubbles and tea leaves and as expected the bubbles go to the center and the tea leaves go to the outside edge along with a few chunks of orange peel. Here we have a rotating sphere with bubbles and chunks from breaking up a small vitamin tablet. And the bubbles go to the center core, but the vitamin chunks seem to stay in their location dispersed through the sphere. And from this we deduced that the vitamin chunks have a density near that of water. While this experiment in itself does not prove anything about the earth being hollow, and I'm certainly not claiming that it is entirely so, as there must be an iron core somewhere that is at least partially responsible for the Earth's magnetosphere, which is the magnetic field surrounding the Earth. However, I did find it interesting to see how different densities separate over time during rotation, and I offer it simply as food for thought. That said, I recently posted a video discussing the possibility of polar entrances into massive cavities which allegedly exist in the Earth's mantle, which at least one world government during the 20th century was convinced was inhabited, which I'll leave a link to in the description. The North and South Pole are not the only alleged entrances into the inner world, which brings us to today's topic. The end of the Earth, the strange history of a mysterious being and the account of a remarkable journey is the title of a novel that also went by the name Edidorpha, which is the backward spelling of the name Aphrodite. The first editions of Edidorpha were distributed privately before it eventually became a success with 18 editions and translated into seven languages. The book alleges that it is from a manuscript dictated by a strange being concerning topics like alchemy, secret Masonic orders, the hollow earth, and the concept of transcending the physical realm. The book's first chapter begins when Johann Drury, studying occult and alchemical phenomena, receives an unexpected visitor late in the night. A white-haired elderly man teleports into his parlor and entrusts a manuscript to our narrator recounting events that transpired three decades earlier during the early part of the 19th century and eventually introducing himself by the name I Am The Man. The manuscript goes on to tell about how the speaker is kidnapped by fellow members of a secret hermetic society because he's suspected to be a threat to the confidentiality of their occult order. Although the secret society is unnamed, the narrator is made to take an oath by raising his hand and repeating after a man who acts as his guide to swear, quote, 
To all this, I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear with a firm and steadfast resolution to keep and perform my oath without the least equivocation, mental reservation, or self-evasion, whatever. A pledge reminiscent of initiatory oaths of multiple degrees in masonry. A man the narrator encounters around the end of the novel says, quote, the future is operative and speculative. Reminiscent of operative and speculative Freemasonry and the speculative science and the operative art in Freemasonry. The being called I am the man is forced to disguise himself and is then taken to a cave in Kentucky. There he is led by a cavern dweller on a long subterranean journey into the underworld. It becomes an inner journey of the spirit as much as a geographical trip through underground realms. The story is so bizarre that there are persisting rumors that the author of the book, John Uri Lloyd, who was a pharmacologist, was high on some sort of drug when writing the novel, but this is merely speculation and has never been proven. The entrance to the inner earth is Kentucky, which happens to be where the Mammoth Cave National Park is located, the longest recorded cave system in the world, with more than 400 miles explored and mapped. The subterranean kingdom has an Alice in Wonderland feel to it, with a landscape of giant mushrooms and upright walking reptilian beings. As they descend deeper into the Earth's interior, passing through forests of colossal fungi, we read, quote, If, in the course of experimentation, a chemist should strike upon a compound that in traces only would subject his mind and drive his pen to record such seemingly extravagant ideas as are found in the hallucinations herein pictured, or to frame word sentences foreign to normal conditions and beyond his natural ability, and yet could he not know the end of such a drug? Would it not be his duty to bury the discovery from others, to cover for mankind the existence of such a noxious fruit of the chemist's or pharmacist's art? With such passages, one can see why there is speculation about the author's involvement with drugs, particularly psilocybin mushrooms. The novel's title stems from an encounter with a beautiful being named Edidorfa, which, as I already stated, is Aphrodite spelled backwards, and appears after the character named I Am The Man declines to drink a distillation of, quote, derivatives of the rarest species of the fungus family. She later introduces herself as an entity once known as Venus, and says things like, quote, Stars and suns, enamored, pulsate and throb in space, and kiss each other in waves of light. Atoms cold embrace and cling together. Structures inanimate affiliate with and attract inanimate structures. Bodies dead to other noble passions are not dead to love. Except for the beautiful Etidorpa, there are no female characters, and she only appears briefly in a hallucination. Once the main character is inside the hollow earth, it just halts. He doesn't even get to meet the goddess of love again. The book makes a substantial effort to scientifically support the idea of a hollow inhabited planet with long passages of speculative science describing the physical structure of the subterranean earth, postulating the effects of gravitation at various places which is much better worked out than some of the non-fiction Hollow Earth books in the genre. With that said, the journey is a not-so-subtle allegory of spiritual progression to being a disembodied adept. Along the way, he loses his youth, loses sunlight, becomes weightless, stops breathing, can hear without ears, and his heart stops. And still, he lives. Each of the steps is symbolic of a progression to a more ethereal plane of existence. Some books are written in the form of a novel in order to present certain esoteric ideas or occult truths without inviting undue attack from various quarters. Etidorpa is considered by most to be a science fiction book, but 
any intelligent and discerning reader realizes that it isn't. The guide in this story was a cavern dweller who was a member of a secret organization whose objective was the preservation of vital knowledge for the future enlightenment of mankind. The objective of this trip was the inner shell of the earth, where the main character was to receive advanced schooling and the ancient mysteries. The book described this amazing trip through the caverns of the inner earth in detail. It also presented some of the philosophy and scientific truths the guide imparted to this man. Since I know most people watching this video will not read the book, even though it's available for free online, I'll go ahead and read an excerpt to you now from chapter 4 titled, A Search for Knowledge, The Alchemistic Letter, in the hopes that it'll give you a glimpse into this special book, so well written and elegantly articulated in its candid expression of the true spiritual gold veiled behind the symbolism of ancient hermeticism or medieval alchemy. Quote, I am the man who, unfortunately for my future happiness, was dissatisfied with such knowledge as could be derived from ordinary books concerning semi-scientific subjects in which I had long been absorbed. I studied the current works of my day on philosophy and chemistry, hoping therein to find something tangible regarding the relationship that exists between matter and spirit, but studied in vain. Astronomy, history, philosophy, and the mysterious, incoherent works of alchemy and occultism were finally appealed to, but likewise failed to satisfy me. These studies were pursued in secret, though I'm not aware that any necessity existed for concealment. Be that as it may, at every opportunity I covertly acquainted myself with such alchemical lore as could be attained either by purchase or by correspondence with others whom I found to be pursuing investigations in the same direction, and ultimately introduced me to a brotherhood of adepts. I discovered that many talented men are still firm believers in the lost art of alchemy, and that among the followers of the thrice-famed Hermes are to be found statesmen, clergymen, lawyers, and scientific men who, for various reasons, invariably conceal with great tact their connection with the fraternity of adepts. It was thus demonstrated, for what I have related is history, that in this 19th century there exists a fraternity, the members of which are as earnest in their belief in the truth of esoteric philosophy as were the followers of Hermes himself, savants who, in secret, circulate among themselves a literature that the materialism of this self-same 19th century has relegated to the deluded and murky periods that produced it. One day, a postal package came to my address, this being the manner in which some of our literature circulated, which, on examination, I found to be a letter of instruction and advice from some unknown member of the circle. I was already becoming disheartened over the mental confusion into which my studies were leading me, and the contents of the letter, in which I was greatly interested, made a lasting impression upon me. It seemed to have been circulated a long time among our members in Europe and America, for it bore numerous marginal notes of various dates, but each and every one of its readers had for one reason or another declined the task therein suggested. From the substance of the paper, which was written exquisitely, yet partook of the ambiguous alchemistic style, it was evident that the author was well versed in alchemy and, in order that my position may be clearly understood at this turning point in a life of remarkable adventure, the letter is appended in full. The alchemistic letter to the brother adept who dares try to discover Zoroaster's cave. Know thou that Hermes Trismegistus did not originate, but he gave to our philosophy his name, the Hermetic Art. Evolved in a dim, mystic age, before antiquity began, it endured through the slowly rolling cycles to be bandied about by the ever-ready flippancy of 19th century students. 
it has lived because it is endowed with that quality which never dies, truth. Modern philosophy, of which chemistry is but a fragment, draws its sustenance from the prime facts which were revealed in ancient Egypt through hermetic thought and fixed by the hermetic stylus. The hermetic allegories, so various in interpretable susceptibility, led subsequent thinkers into speculations and experimentations which have resulted profitably to the world. It is not strange that some of the followers of Hermes, especially the more mercurial and imaginative, should have evolved nebulous theories, no longer explainable, and involving recondite spiritual considerations. Know thou that the ultimate on psychochemical investigation is the proximate of the infinite. Accordingly, a class came to believe that a projection of natural mental faculties into an advanced state of consciousness called the wisdom faculty constitutes the final possibility of alchemy. The attainment of this exalted condition is still believed practicable by many earnest savants. Once on this lofty plane, the individual would not be trammeled by material obstacles, but would abide in that spiritual placidity, which is the exquisite realization of mortal perfection. So exalted, he would be a naked parallelism with omniscience, and through his illuminated understanding, could feast his soul on those exalted pleasures which are only less than deific. Having become a member of the secret society as directed by the writer of the letter I have just read, and having obtained the secrets hinted at in the mystic directions, my next desire was to find a secluded spot where, without interruption, I could prepare for publication what I had gathered surreptitiously in the lodges of the fraternity I designed to betray. Another fascinating chapter discusses the ambient light that permeates the subterranean world, which is not overtly bright like the surface world lit by one central point, which is obviously the sun, but allegedly has a soft diffused glow, evenly distributed, which grew in intensity the deeper they traveled. The science behind how this can be was subtly revealed and exquisitely disclosed. Quote, a zone of light deep in the earth, incomprehensible, incredible, I muttered, and yet as we went onward and time passed, the darkness was less intense. The barely perceptible hue became gray and somber, and then of a pearly translucence, and although I could not distinguish the outline of objects, yet I unquestionably perceived light. I am amazed. What can be the cause of this phenomenon? What is the nature of this mysterious halo that surrounds us? I held my open hand before my eyes and perceived the darkness of my spread fingers. It is light. It is light, I shouted. It is really light. The guide said that, Compose yourself. This emotional exhibition is an evidence of weakness. An investigator should neither become depressed over a reverse nor unduly enthusiastic over a fortunate discovery. But we approach the Earth's surface. Soon I will be back in the sunshine again. Upon the contrary, we have been continually descending into the Earth, and we are now ten miles or more beneath the level of the ocean. Listen to me, he said. Can you not understand that I have led you continually down a steep descent, and that for hours there has been no step upward, with but little exertion, you have walked this distance without becoming wearied, and you could not, without great fatigue, have ascended for so long a period. You are entering a zone of inner earth light. We are in the surface, the upper edge of it. Let us hasten on, for when this cavern darkness is at an end, and I will say we have nearly passed that limit, your courage will return, and then we will rest. 
you surely do not speak the truth. Science and philosophy, and I am somewhat versed in both, have never told me of such a light. Can philosophers more than speculate about that which they have not experienced if they have no data from which to calculate? Name the student in science who has reached this depth in the earth, or has seen a man to tell him of these facts. I cannot. Then why should you have expected any of them to describe our surroundings? Misguided men will torture science by refuting facts with theories, but a fact is no less a fact when science opposes. I recognize the force of his arguments, and cordially grasped his hand in indication of submission. We continued our journey, and rapidly traveled downward and onward. The light gradually increased in intensity, until at length the cavern near about us seemed to be as bright as diffused daylight could have made it. There was apparently no central point of radiation. The light was such as to pervade and exist in the surrounding space, somewhat as the vapor of phosphorus spreads as self-luminous haze throughout the bubble into which it is blown. The visual agent surrounding us had a permanent, self-existing luminosity and was a pervading, bright, unreachable essence that, without an obvious origin, diffused itself equally in all directions. And while each chapter provides its own nugget of esoteric wisdom layered beneath a refreshingly scientific explanation, I will close this presentation with an excerpt from chapter 18 called The Food of Man. Quote, you are, or should be, aware of other and as marked differences in food products of upper earth induced by climate, soil, and cultivation. The potato, which, next to wheat, rice, or corn, you know supplies nations of men with starchy food, originated as a wild weed in South America and Mexico, where it yet exists as a small, watery, marble-like tuber, and its nearest kindred, botanically, is still poisonous. The luscious apple reached its present excellence by slow stages from naughty, wild, astringent fruit, to which it again returns when escaped from cultivation. Oranges, in their wild condition, are bitter and are used principally as medicinal agents. Asparagus was once a weed native to the salty edges of the sea, and as this weed has become a food, so it is possible for other wild weeds yet to do. The wild parsnip is a poison, and the parsnip of cultivation relapses quickly into its natural condition if allowed to escape and roam again. The root of the tapioca plant contains a volatile poison and is deadly, but when the same root is properly prepared, it becomes the wholesome food, tapioca. Such examples might be multiplied indefinitely, but I have cited enough to illustrate the fact that neither the difference in size and structure of the species in the mushroom forest through which we are passing, nor the conditions of these bodies, as compared with those you formerly knew, need excite your astonishment. Cultivate a potato in your former home so that the growing tuber is exposed to sunshine and it becomes green and acrid and strongly virulent. Cultivate the spores of the intra-earth fungi about us on the face of the earth, and although now all parts of the plants are edible, the species will degenerate and may even become poisonous. They lose their flavor under such unfavorable conditions, and although some species will retain vitality enough to resist poisonous degeneration, they dwindle in size and adapt themselves to new and unnatural conditions. They have all degenerated. Here, they live on water, pure nitrogen, and its modifications grasping with their roots the carbon of the disintegrated limestone, affiliating these substances and evolving from these bodies rich and delicate flavors far superior to the flavor of earth surface foods. On the surface of the earth, after they become abnormal, they live only on dead and devitalized organic matter, having lost the power of assimilating elementary matter. They then partake of the nature of animals, breathe oxygen and exhale carbonic acid, as animals do, being the reverse of other plant existences. Here they breathe oxygen, nitrogen, and vapor of water, but exhale some of the carbon in combination with hydrogen, 
thus evolving these delicate ethereal essences instead of the poisonous gas, carbonic acid. Their substance is here made up of all the elements necessary for the support of animal life. Nitrogen to make muscle, carbon and hydrogen for fat, lime for bone. This fungoid forest could feed a multitude. It is probable that in the time to come when man deserts the bleak earth's surface, as he will someday be forced to do, as has been the case in frozen planets that are not now inhabited on the outer crust, nations will march through these spaces on their way from the dreary outside earth to the delights of the salubrious inner sphere. Here then, when that day of necessity appears, as it will surely come under inflexible climatic changes that will control the destiny of outer earth life, these constantly increasing stores adapted to nourish humanity will be found accumulated and ready for food. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.